Good afternoon, everyone. I am so happy to be this afternoon with all of you. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us this afternoon. Uh, I would like to uh, begin the session today uh, just uh, welcoming our speakers. So we are going to be this afternoon and I'm going to stop sharing right away the, my screen, but um, I'm going to start right away uh, introducing our speakers of today. Dr. Amy Belton, Director of the Center for Global Engineering and Associate Professor of Mechanical and Industrial Engineering, Dean's Catalyst Professor, and Dr. Yu Chen, Project Lead of the Center for Global Engineering and the, the person responsible for the project Sustainable Theory Urbanization Research Initiative and Postdoctoral Research Associate. Thank you to both of you uh, for taking the time to be with us this afternoon. And at the same time, I wanna say hello and welcome to Roddy McEwen. Uh, Probably, Roddy, I didn't pronounce it in the, in the right way. So probably you are going to say in, the, in, in a better way afterwards. But Roddy is the admissions and international student advisor from School of Graduate Studies at the University of Toronto. And Roddy will help us with the section question and answer uh, along the presentation and at the same time at the end of the session, okay? So I will just uh, start right away sharing with you the agenda of the day. So initially we will do a very short presentation about Caldo and the services that we provide to students coming to study uh, masters or PhD programs to our universities here in Canada. Uh, we will follow the, our, my presentation right away by the main speakers of today, Dr. Amy Belton and Dr. Ju Chen. And then we will have the question and answer section. And of course, they will provide the final remarks at the end of the session. So please don't forget to write all your questions in the section question and answer of Zoom. And that's basically the most important information that I wanna share with you right away. So let's start with the Global Challenges and Global Engineering webinar, Connecting Latin America and Canada Through Engineering. Thank you again to every one of you for being here this afternoon. Uh, we are very pleased to have uh, a lot of people participating from different countries. So I'm going to right away start my presentation, sharing with you my screen. Uh, could you confirm, please, if uh, you can see correctly the information, Laudi? Yes. Perfect. Yes. Okay. Excellent. Thank you so much. So let's go right away to the information about Caldo. Uh, there is, okay. So there was some. Caldo basically uh, is a consortium of top. Canadian research universities offering highly ranked graduate programs in English or French to students from all over Latin America. Uh, probably some of you have been already in contact with us. Probably some of you are already applying to some of our universities in Canada. So you know what Caldo does, but basically we build partnerships with government agencies and funding partners in Latin America. So far, we have uh, partnerships with nine different countries in Latin America, from Mexico up to Chile. Uh, and at the same time, we provide advice and support candidates from the same region, Latin America, in their application process to graduate programs, basically, PhD programs and thesis based master's programs at any Caldo members' universities. Uh, in the past, 
some of you probably have been in some of our events. I mean, in the last two years, year and a half at this point, maybe uh, more precisely, we haven't been traveling because of the pandemic situation, but of course uh, it is something that we are expecting that we will be able to visit the countries again uh, sooner than later and to have the opportunity to talk to along with our colleagues from the universities uh, to have the opportunity to talk with every one of you on the ground and visiting your universities, probably where every one of you is studying right now. What are the Caldo members universities? Basically, uh, the University of Alberta, Dalhousie University, Université Laval, McMaster University, University of Saskatchewan, of course, our guest of today, University of Toronto, University of Waterloo and Western University. So all the Caldo members universities are distributed uh, along the country in different provinces. So you know probably that in Canada, we are a bilingual country. So we have universities and most of them that they offer their programs in English, but at the same time, we do have universities such as Université Laval that offer programs in French as well. What does Caldo benefit students? Uh, how does Caldo, sorry, benefit students? Basically, we are a single point of contact just to facilitate the information that you require for applying to any master's or PhD program at any Caldo members university. So we try to be one single door for getting information right away about our eight Caldo members universities. And at the same time, we provide guidance on researching what could be the ideal, the best master degree or PhD program according to your research goals. We provide at the same time guidance on how to connect with potential supervisors, something that is so important when every one of you is applying mainly to a PhD program, but at the same time to many master's programs at any Caldo members universities. And at the same time, we provide any additional information that you could request or you will need in order to arrive or to any of our programs here in Canada. And hopefully sooner than later, just to start uh, visiting our campuses and arriving to study on the ground here in Canada as well. Uh, most of the information that I have been sharing with you, of course, you can find uh, through our website, caldo.ca, information about uh, studying in Canada, our universities, links to a, a specific website of our universities, different tools, supplies, etc. And at the same time, we are sharing to our webpage a lot of events that we are organizing, especially in the last month, uh, online events that we have been doing with different partners, different universities for providing information to potential candidates coming from Latin America. And at the same time, something that could be very useful for you in our homepage, you will find out a program browser where you will be able to type in this section, basically uh, the name of the program that you are looking for. And you can choose uh, any or, uh, or I don't know, any specific university and the degree level that you are looking for, master degrees or PhD. And you are gonna get right away a list of the programs uh, coming out from the website of our universities. So just to finalize this uh, church presentation about Caldo, I just wanna remind you that of course you can get information about ourselves through our website, caldo.ca, but at the same time, you can follow us through our different, different social, channel, social media channels, such as uh, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, or YouTube. 
uh, a lot of the webinars that we have been offering in the last month are available on our website. And later, uh, this webinar that we are organizing today will be available as well for all of you that are attending today this session. So I'm going to stop sharing my presentation right now. And just I want to welcome again Dr. Amy Belton and Dr. Yu Chen. Thank you so much to both of you for taking the time to share uh, your busy agenda and, 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 and all, of course, all the activities that you have been organizing in the last couple of months with us this afternoon. And please, the, the stage is yours at this point. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Rodrigo. I think uh, you and I are both very excited to, to chat with you today. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the things that we've been doing in the center that we both work in, and I, I direct and you as you works in the center, the Center for Global Engineering, and really that center really focuses on, on uh, different types of global challenges, and we have some partnership programs with, uh, with Mexico that you're going to focus on as we chat today. So, um, yeah, so I'm really excited to talk to you today. Um, before, we, before we get going, just to um, remind you a bit about me and who I am. So I'm a, I'm a professor in mechanical and industrial engineering and associate professor. Um, but I also direct uh, this cross-disciplinary center for global engineering that we're going to chat about. Um, in my own research, which I'll touch on a little bit later on as we chat today, um, I work on water and energy systems. And particularly, a lot of the applications we look at are applications related to global development. Um, so we'll get a chance to touch on at least one of the projects that we've been working on uh, with an NGO Techo in Mexico, looking at um, access to safe sanitation in peri-urban areas. So uh, just, a quick, just a quick background on me and feel free to look me up if you wanna get more, get more details. Um, and just before we start talking more about uh, the Center for Global Engineering, where both you and I, um, you and I work, uh, you know, just I'll say a few words about the Faculty of Engineering more more broadly at U of T. Um, this is just a this is just a great picture, and unfortunately, you can't come to you can't, it's not easy to come to Toronto and visit campus uh, right now. But this is a uh, a picture um, uh, of the main kind of part of campus. And if you were to come and give us a visit um, when you came to Toronto, you would be able to come and visit us up here in this. Uh, this beautiful building here with a great, great view looking out over, over the, the part of the, of the campus. Um, and it's a great, University of Toronto it's a, you know, it's a great place to study. It's located in downtown Toronto, so right in the heart of the city, but at the same time, a little bit of an oasis from kind of some of the hustle bustle and that's in the city. So it's a great, it's a great spot. Um, just a quick, some quick background more broadly about the faculty before I jump in talking more about uh, some of the things that we've been working on and some of the things you might think about if you're thinking about graduate research, particularly in the area of engineering and global development. But um, so more bro broadly, the Faculty of Applied Science and Engineering, it's, uh, it's um, often ranked as the, as the number one engineering school in Canada. Um, and it has, we have a very strong faculty, uh, over 260 different faculty members. Uh, many of them leaders in their field, 120 of those are, are faculty members which have been selected by the government of Canada as, as really the leading experts in their field and our research chairs. So very, very strong um, in terms of, uh, you know, the capabilities of research. Uh, we have uh, five different departments. Uh, I'm not going to go through and read them all. Uh, and then we also, in addition to having departments, we have initiatives that really stretch uh, and, and go across departments as well. So innovation clusters um, in many different areas from you know, thinking about manufacturing, data analytics and art artificial intelligence, health, robotics, uh, sustainability, and water. So there's, you know, it's a, you know, it just as a, a quick summary, you know, University of Toronto often ranked as the number one engineering school in Canada, uh, often in, within the top 25 in the world. So a great place, uh, lots of strong colleagues there. Um, what we're going to chat about today is some of the cross-disciplinary research, which, uh, which we're leading within the Center for Global Engineering, where uh, you and I work. So 
Uh, the center, it's, uh, it's a, it was founded in 2011, and really we work with over 25 faculty members uh, within engineering and also elsewhere at the university who are interested in thinking about how technology can play a role in global development. What we do is we look at uh, how we can use, uh, think about the, using the expertise we have within engineering to help address some really global challenges uh, associated with the sustainable development goals. And our other mission is to be able to uh, train the next generation of engineers to be able to uh, address some of these challenges as well. We have a range of stuff that we do within the center um, from different research programs to courses is, uh, courses and other, other things as well. Uh, what I'm gonna focus on today is some of the things that we've been doing in the area of research, just to give you a flavor of what some of the topics um, if you're interested in this area of thinking about how engineering can play a role in global development, what some of those topics and what some of those research projects really look like. Uh, so within the center, we've had a number of projects. Really what we do overall in the center is we think about uh, technology and technology development and think about where there are gaps, where uh, you know global development challenges can be addressed in a range of ways. It can be addressed, you know, there can be policy things which may address global development challenges. But really in the center, we try to think about, is there a technical gap that's there? Um, and really how we can help fill that. So what we will do is we'll typically look at a particular problem, think about if there's a technical gap there. And we think about this overall kind of design process when thinking about that technical gap, trying to understand why is there the technical gap? Maybe it's not really, people don't really, aren't, aren't really understanding the problem uh, very well. Uh, maybe they're not really thinking about when they're going through and doing the research, um, really fundamentally what's going on. So we can try to make sure that we're not going to be missing something that we should. And when we actually go through the design process. So really what we try to do in the center overall is to be on the research side is to really develop context appropriate solutions that will help address uh, challenges related to global development. And then also think about how we can take these technologies and scale them up. So we have a number of initiatives that we've had within the center and there's a, a number that we've had over time. Um, oops, sorry, I went backwards, sorry about that. Um, and so I'm gonna just give a quick picture of what some of the types of research topics have looked like under these, under these initiatives. Um, so we have these, the, the first three here are older initiatives where some of the projects are still ongoing, but um, uh, um, you know, we aren't actively managing them in the center uh, to some of the newer ones here on the right. Uh, and then, so um, I'll start off here talking about this project related to shelter, and then I'll hand it off to uh, Dr. Yu Chen to talk a little bit more about our initiative related to sustainable peri-urbanization. So just to give a little bit of a flavor of the types of research projects, and these are all projects which have been conducted either by masters or PhD students at, at University of Toronto under, under the guidance of, uh, under the guidance of uh, different uh, faculty uh, members. Um, so we have had initiatives within the center which have focused really on uh, aspects related to sustainable shelter um, in different, in the, in the global context. So some of the types of examples of projects that we've, uh, that we've had um, have looked at some of these multi, uh, these large multi-unit residential buildings. Um, you know, a lot of the urbanization that's happening worldwide, it relies on the development of these types of buildings and many of them are in earthquake prone areas and Mexico has many of these areas as well. Um, so some of the research which has been going on in the center have been related to uh, earthquake resilience and how to make these buildings earthquake resilient in a cost-effective way. Uh, and, uh, and particularly um, in, the context of, in the context of Mumbai. So this is a project was still ongoing with partners in India looking at some, uh, looking at how we can do some isolation platforms which will work for these large uh, multi-unit buildings uh, as well. 
one of the other projects in this under this area of shelter, which we've been, uh, which was uh, ongoing within the center, is thinking for these also these large multi unit buildings. Is there very simple things that can be done to improve the thermal comfort in these buildings? So these large multi unit buildings, especially in places, you know, we have an example here from India. Um, temperatures get very high. So are there things that you can do very simply when you're thinking about the design of these buildings, um, which can improve the thermal comfort uh, of, of these types of structures. So these are some examples of some of the things that we've been working on under the center in the area of shelter. And again, these are things which are led by um, masters and PhD students. We've had a range of projects also thinking about uh, food and nutritional security. And these I'm not going to go through all of these projects here. I'll focus in on a few, um, a few just to give some context. Um, uh, but these projects really range from uh, thinking about um, things that we can do. This is actually a project which I, which I led. Um, things that you can do for low-income farmers to be able to improve their productivity. So this project really focused on. Um, this particular project actually focused on irrigation and many um, rural farmers. So rural farmers might use some uh, irrigation to improve their food production, but a lot of the practices which they use for irrigation are very ad hoc. They don't really know how much they should be irrigating their, their foods to be able to maximize their, their, their yields and be water efficient at the same time. So uh, I have a student in my lab who developed a um, purely mechanical uh, irrigation controller uh, that um, basically just uses the uses the um, the moisture level of the soil to open and close a valve and regulate water into an, into into an irrigation system. Uh, and then those students have since taken that technology and now have started a company and are actually working towards commercializing that technology. Um, other projects which have been going on within the area of food and nutritional security uh, uh, down, down here, um, there's really a need for many farmers to be able to understand if they're going to be applying the amount of right of, amount, the right amount of fertilizer. Um, so there's actually uh, a group which has been working at really being able to characterize what's going on in the soil so they understand the amount of nitri nitrogen that's there and how much fertilizer should be able to be, should be able to, should be applied. Sorry, I don't know why the slides are advancing back and forth on, on their own, um, uh, to be able to uh, enable farmers to have uh, effective, um, yeah, effective fertilization of their fields. Uh, some other examples. So we had a, another larger initiative related to diagnostics and public health. And this is just, again, a quick sampling of some of the projects which were done, uh, which were uh, conducted again by masters and PhD students in the course of their in the course of their work. Uh, so we had a uh, a group which was looking at understanding the uh, could they actually put together a very low cost air quality sensor. So um, in many different industrial environments or home environments, uh, there will be a lot of particulate matter in the air. Um, and there's a need to be able to understand, uh, you know, what that particular matter level is. So this, this group led by Arthur Chan in chemical engineering uh, developed a very simple system, which basically um, uh, sucked air through a very small filter paper uh, and then used a system, uh, optical based system, which you could couple up with a smartphone to be able to then characterize uh, based on what they saw, what the actual air quality level is. So very inexpensive, cheap air quality sensor. Um, and then there are other, other types of projects under this idea as well in terms of diagnostics towards public health. Um, so that's just a quick picture of some of the types of projects. Um, and again, these are projects all led by masters and PhD students uh, under that we've had previously within in the center. We have a few larger initiatives which are currently ongoing within the center. Uh, and uh, so these, I, uh, so one of them I'm just highlighting here is the reconciliation. It's called the Reconciliation Through Engineering Initiative. Um, within Canada, as, there, as in many places in the world, we have many 
uh, indigenous communities. Uh, many of those communities um, are remote um, within Canada, and there's a lot of infrastructure challenges. Uh, infrastructure challenges is, um, for many of those particular communities. There's also been a tradition, uh, an unfortunate tradition within Canada, um, historically, of uh, exploitation, exploitation of Indigenous peoples. So uh, the Centre actually took the lead on developing a program which looked at how we can do respectful and collaborative research uh, with different Indigenous communities within Canada, really to uh, partner with them and based on community priorities related to infrastructure, see if there were areas where uh, us within engineering could contribute towards improving uh, improving some of the uh, aspects of quality of life in many of these uh, first these indigenous communities within 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 Canada. So we've had a number of uh, there are a number of communities which we're collaborating with, uh, and we have a number of projects which are on the go. These are just a snapshot of of three of those projects which are currently on the go uh, related to um, you know this type of uh, this type of work. Um, you know, one of them is related to housing. Uh, there are a lot of housing challenges and issues with um, housing in many Indigenous communities related to moisture and ventilation. Um, and there's a desire for many Indigenous communities to be able to um, incorporate aspects of their own kind of natural building methods into their, into their housing. So we have a project um, being led by Marianne Tucci who's over in civil engineering, looking at linking up, um, you know, understanding uh, the, the needs of the Indigenous communities and trying to understand the impacts of, you know, a conventional building house versus some of the more natural alternatives Indigenous communities are typically using on some of these critical things in terms of moisture and ventilation. Uh, we have another project, um, which is being led by Chigan Lee and Chris Beck over in industrial engineering, which is actually looking at how you get supplies to many of these re remote communities within Canada. Um, so within Canada, um, to give you an idea, um, many, if you're looking in within Ontario, which is the province where, Ontario, where, where Toronto is, uh, there's many remote communities up in Northern Ontario. And the only way to get supplies into those communities, there's no traditional roads into them because it's it's quite remote. Uh, the only way to get supplies into those communities is in the winter time, rivers will freeze up and they will actually drive um, drive uh, goods up to the communities on, on, on these frozen rivers in the winter time, or they'll fly goods in um, to these particular areas as well. So it's a really big logistical challenge. There's only so much of the year where you can actually drive goods into many of these rural communities. So this project is actually looking at partnering with those communities and looking at understanding um, how can you be strategic when you're thinking about planning and optimizing um, the delivery of goods to many of these, uh, many of these areas. Uh, and then one last uh, project has been focused really on uh, wastewater management. So this is uh, with an Indigenous community uh, up on Lake, uh, Lake Simcoe, which is about an hour or so north of the city of Toronto. Um, there is, uh, so there's, a, a, there's a, a community there that's on an island in the middle of that lake. And there are concerns about some of the contaminants which are coming from different, um, different um, you know, different uh, industries and and municipalities which are discharging into that lake. So this project is actually looking at understanding um, what's happening with those particular, uh, those particular um, sources of potential contamination, what's happening over time, and, uh, and really being able to characterize that to be able to inform the community about what some of those, what some of those challenges really are. So that's just a quick picture of some of the types of projects which are going on within the center. Um, we've had a few other kind of things which have been just under development. Uh, this is a new one, which is start, which we're just starting. And this is a project, which is uh, a set of projects, which is together with 
uh, with um, uh, the India Institute of Technology uh, in Mumbai. Um, uh, so it's just, uh, so we've set up a number of collaborative projects and these ones are actually just get ongoing. So I can't tell you too much about all of these, um, but uh, uh, these are projects which are really related to agricultural and sustainable development. So, um, and their collaborations together. So I'm not gonna go through the details of all of these just because they're just projects which are ongoing, uh, just coming together. Um, but they have that similar flavor of, uh, you know, of uh, thinking about how engineering can play that role in global development. So yeah, that's just a quick, just a quick snapshot of some of the types of work. So I'm gonna pass it over now to uh, Dr. Yu Chen who works, who works with me in the center. And uh, you, can, you can just let me know when you want me uh -huh. to advance any of the slides. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Putin. And uh, many thanks uh, to Galto for having us in today's seminar. So we'll be happy to talk about the uh, Sustainable Peri-Urbanization Research Initiative. Um, so as Rodrigo kindly introduced, uh, I'm Yu Chen and I'm a postdoc research associate here at CGEN and I'm coordinating this uh, Sustainable Peri-Urbanization uh, Initiative. I'm actually a sociologist by training um, and my research focuses on urban and housing development, sustainability, uh, environmental justice, uh, eco technology, and intersection of um, uh, technology and society with a geographical focus on Latin America and East Asia. Um, so, actually, for my dissertation, I, I compared um, the social housing development, las políticas de vivienda de interés social, uh, in Mexico and in China, in which I conducted a two year ethnographic research in the periphery of Guadalajara, Mexico. And um, so as you can see, my research takes more of um, a community engagement and fieldwork uh, approach. Um, next slide, please. So um, the SPUR initiative um, is actually um, only uh, launched in December, 2019. And this initiative aims to um, implement participatory engineering projects to tackle sustainability challenges in the context of fast growing peri-urban interface of mega cities uh, in the global south with primary focus on Mexico City's informal settlements. Um, a little bit background of the SPUR initiative. The UN um, estimates that by 2050, 66% of the world's population will be living in the cities. The faster growing mega cities over the past decade have been primarily in developing uh, nations. And much of that urban expansion takes place in the sprawling peri-urban um, fringes where poverty and a deficit in infrastructure have made communities vulnerable to events such as climate change and um, epidemics. As a mega city with a population of over 22 million, uh, Mexico City's metropolitan area faces um, enormous sustainability and resilience challenges, um, such as access to clean water, sanitation, um, earthquake response, uh, food security, transportation, affordable housing, etc. Particularly in its large extensions of informal settlements in the peri-urban, peri uh, in the peri periphery. Um, but meanwhile, Mexico City is also home to numerous community-based eco-technology initiatives, social struggles for environmental justice and rights to city, as well as policy initiatives and infrastructure projects aiming to solve these sustainability challenges caused by rapid urbanization. Mexico also has a very active, um, experienced and engaged community of scholars working on uh, these subjects. Um, so other mega cities in the world can really learn a great deal from Mexico City's experience. Um, so currently the SPUR initiative um, is developing along three uh, major lines. The first one is um, we're conducting uh, interdisciplinary kind of research on sustainability challenges and community-based uh, eco-technology initiatives in Mexico City. But meanwhile, we also really want to turn the SPUR initiative into a platform for promoting uh, collaboration, exchange, and partnership between uh, U of T engineering and the Mex Mexico's academic institutions, NGOs, and social enterprises. 
So we are working very hard to identify research opportunities for our students and faculty members. And in the next slide, I want to talk a little bit about um, our partnership development, uh, research and our some kind of long-term uh, goals. So, so far we have established working relationship with a number of NGOs and uh, social enterprises in Mexico, um, like just La Urbana, Sarash, uh, Formulation, Ilu Mexico, Cooperativa Energia, Habitat International Co uh, Coalition, uh, Aso Asociación Mexicana de Energía Solar, just to name a few. And we have uh, signed a collaboration agreement with uh, three organizations, Techo, Centro Eure, and Paracata. So these organizations and companies really actively work in areas such as water and sanitation, renewable energy, sustainability, promotion of eco-technology, et cetera. So we're exploring diverse forms of collaboration with these organizations, such as joint research projects, uh, guest lectures, and some other events. So in most of the cases, we can contribute our uh, research capacity and NGOs and social enterprises share with us their insights and real world uh, experiences, participate in research design and provide a kind of bridge that connect us with the communities. Um, next slide, please. So um, here's a list of ongoing projects under this SPUR initiative. So I'm actually working on um, the first of three projects with Dr. Bilton. So uh, they cover uh, topics including like disaster risk reduction, access to clean water and renewable energy. Uh, due to the pandemic, their survey and uh, in interviews have, have to be online and on-site uh, uh, evaluation is kind of in, impossible. But that being said, we're still doing the online part and we're doing a lot of like res uh, archive research, uh, collecting the best practices and examples of failure, literature review. Um, what make these projects relevant to engineering, in my opinion, is that they help to place um, the engineering projects to wider into wider like so structural and institutional contexts. Um, also want to understand what challenges and obstacles NGOs face when they promote eco technology initiatives in marginalized communities. Um, what are the best strategies and approaches that make long-term community engagement uh, possible? And at the same time, by making uh, connections with NGOs and, and uh, social enterprises, we can also identify potential research collaboration, collaboration opportunities for uh, U of T uh, faculties and, and uh, students. So um, for engineers, uh, in my opinion, I think what we're doing at SPUR um, highlights an important and a meaningful paradigm of research, that is um, community engagement can inform engineers the uh, parameters um, of research and design. So in the research design, it will address the need of the community and end, the end, uses, end users. The design should be technically and socially sound, and the approach is more of like a co-design and exchange um, of knowledge systems so the goal is really to facilitate the community appropriation of the technology and understand how engineering um, projects can empower marginalized communities to address poverty and, um, and um, environmental degradation and other issues. Um, and this is definitely also the case for the next uh, projects. For example, our PhD candidate, Pablo uh, Cotera, who's also from Mexico City, is currently uh, undertaking his dissertation project on sustainable sanitation dry toilets in Mexico City. And Dr. Bilton will um, later discuss this project. Um, and um, we also have three projects that are undergraduate capstone projects uh, in collaboration with our NGO partners. So for example, this uh, first project, the rainwater harvesting um, related to uh, improving the system of the device for rainwater harvesting uh, was actually completed last, last April. And um, so Dejo is now uh, uh, testing the design as you can see in the picture in the next slide. Um, so, and Mexico City right now is in the rainy season as well. So like, it's a good, good timing to test like our design. Um, so I guess we can go to the next slide. So, 
An encouraging progress that we're making right now is uh, an international doctoral cluster that we are uh, developing with the Instituto de Ingeniería de la Universidad Autónoma Nacional de México. So um, an international doctoral cluster is a research and training agreement uh, between uh, University of Toronto and international uh, academic partners aiming to promote joint research projects and a student exchange um, in a lapse of like three to five years. Uh, it's supported by the uh, University of Toronto's Office of Vice President International uh, to foster uh, international research-driven partnerships. So in December 2020, the leadership of the two institutions had an had a online meeting and which both institutions are committed to um, establishing deeper and impactful um, research uh, partnerships starting from uh, creating this IBC, uh, International Doctoral Cluster on Water and Sanitation. Uh, actually, in the past January, like 22 participating professors from both universities um, shared their uh, research interests with each other. And we identified uh, actually more than uh, 20 uh, collaborative research projects in which we, are, we have selected like nine of them uh, uh, for this at this stage. And um, um, so uh, we, based on like the feedback from the participating professors, uh, we also have like a number of like research meetings to have some like some of the in-depth uh, discussions on specific research projects. So uh, we really hope that we're, we're really hopeful that some, sometime this year we can like officially launch this uh, international doctoral cluster. And um, some of these uh, uh, these projects are also ongoing, like uh, participating professors are working on the research proposals and things like that. Um, so next slide, please. I think that's the list of the, uh, the nine research projects, collaborative research projects that we have identified now. They're also ongoing. So um, uh, hopefully uh, we are, will be able to like launch uh, some of them like this year. So just to, to wrap up, so we want to uh, incorporate like community engagement and a social justice perspective to engineering research. Um, we are committed to bringing uh, students and uh, professors at, a U, at U of T the opportunities of research collaboration with multiple like stakeholders in Mexico. Um, we also want to continue promoting uh, like interdisciplinary kind of research and partnership with industry and uh, government agencies. So that's the long-term vision that we have. So I think I will hand over the presentation to Dr. Pilton. Thanks. Uh, thanks you very much for the, for the overview of SPUR. So I'm just gonna give you a quick example, a bit more of an in-depth example of, of some of the research which is going on. This is actually one of the projects which is under under the SPUR umbrella that you mentioned. Um, and I'll try to do this really quickly because I wanna make sure that we have time for the Q&A at the end. So I'll try to do this in about four minutes or so. Let's see if I can do it. Um, this is actually a project which is being conducted by one of my PhD students, uh, Pablo Quatera, who's actually from, he's actually from Mexico and, and st uh, studying in my research group. Um, We've identified sanitation in peri-urban areas as like a big as a big gap. There's not really there's no sewer infrastructure available. Um, so many of the areas in these peri-urban communities will have a toilet looks that looks something on the right. So this is actually a poor flush toilet. There's no plumbing. So to flush the toilet, people will just pour some water in, um, and then because there's no sewerage, typically the water from here is actually not being properly treated. It goes into you know, unlined pits, uh, which then eventually will fill up, can overflow in a rain, rainy type of event and cause a lot of big public health issues. So this has been a big gap in terms of many of these peri-urban areas and looking at different types of sustainable solutions is something that uh, a lot of the NGOs and the NGO Techo that we're looking at, that we're working with is interested in. So Pablo has been working on the design aspect, but as a first phase in his research, he really wanted to understand how the toilets were currently being used and what some of the gaps were. So what we actually, you know, there's a couple different ways that you can engage in research to try to understand that. Uh, you can look at surveys and do surveys or in census data, um, but these are often kind of uh, incomplete and 
and and not really you know giving the full picture. Um, you can actually do targeted surveys with end users and think about uh, doing observation. A lot of times, if you're thinking about these types of projects and developing different technologies, you actually do observational work. Um, there's a lot of issues with that, especially if you're thinking about sanitation. Um, you know, if you're asking people questions, often people will have some bias in their in their error in their in their answers because uh, because they are trying to tell the interviewer what they want to hear. Uh, and for observational research, we can't really do that. For uh, thinking about sanitation, you can't really watch someone use the toilet and understand how they're using the toilet. Um, so we thought about how we can think about getting quantitative data in addition to doing some of these surveys to try to understand how people are using their current sanitation that they have available. So the idea behind this is that we can actually develop some sets of embedded sensing to be able to really understand what's going on and be able to understand the problem before we can start going through and doing engineering design. So Pablo, who's one of my students in the first phase of his research, what he did is he really wanted to really understand the problem. Um, so he developed this little embedded system here. Uh, you know, you can see a picture of this is the what, what's, what goes inside and this is the size of the size of the box, but the size of two decks of cards or so that could be hung within a toilet. And what it does is it will monitor methane. It'll tell us, tell us you know, if someone's using the toilet, if it's feces or urine. Uh, it had a little sensor that monitored the water level and that tells us if they're actually flushing the toilet after they use it. Uh, and then he had a sensor also that turned, determined how many times it's being used. So from this, you can tell a whole lot in terms of how this particular system is being used. We could actually go through and understand you know, how many times it's being used, if it's, if it's feces or urine, um, and, and really what's going on in the actual use of this type of system. And then this is something which can help us and where it is currently helping us when we're thinking about the overall design process in conjunction with interviews and surveys, which we're doing with the, with the, with the community members, um, really understanding how it's used enables us to think about setting requirements and thinking about what needs to be done going forward with the design. And that's really, you know, just the, you know, an idea and that's a first phase of a PhD research, which is being done by a student within this area, within this area, within my group. So I'll wrap it up there. I did it in four minutes, so that's good. Um, so just to get a quick, quick picture of some, some types of things that, uh, you know, a first phase of a research project. Um, so yeah, this is just uh, you and I were chatting a little bit today about some of the things that have been going on within the Center for Global Engineering. Really, we're trying to look at how technology can play a role in global development, thinking about um, how we can bring not only the technical aspects together, but thinking more about um, you know, the social uh, and other types of aspects which really need to come together to make something really work. Um, and yeah, I'm happy to chat with you more about that. Or if you want just more to chat more about you know, what it's like as a graduate student um, or more of these types of projects, I'm happy to do that with the, with the time we have left. Well, thank you so much, uh, Amy, Dr. Amy Bilton, Dr. Yu Chen, for all your information, really very interesting information that you have been sharing about the center and at the same time, the very, honestly, very appealing solutions that you have been finding out uh, for the situation in Mexico. So it is uh, quite interesting to see how engineering is clearly a discipline that is looking for solutions, so real solutions for the real challenges that we are facing right now. So that is something that of course is going to be, I am pretty sure, very attractive for a lot of people that are listening to your information this afternoon. So thank you so much for that. Um, thank you to everyone as well that you have been sharing your questions through the question and answer section. And I wanna say thank you to Roddy because he has been very efficient in answering most of the questions. Uh, meanwhile, Dr. Amy Bilton and Dr. Yu Shen were sharing their information. So thank you, Roddy, for that. But of course, there are some additional questions here. I don't know, Roddy, if uh, you want to take them or maybe to share some of them right away with um, Amy or Ju, um, or we can do it, Roddy. I'm just going to finish answering one question for Maurizio that I'm in, sort of in the middle of, and then Perfect. I can jump on and start Absolutely. answering live, which will be 
Absolutely. more efficient. So, so what I'm going to do right away is going to take some of the questions that we have here right now, and maybe uh, Dr. Belton or Dr. Chen could help us to answer some of those questions as well. So here we have one from Verena. Um, good afternoon. Is there any possibility of remote internship opportunities related to mechanical or electrical engineering? Yeah, I think um, that's, a, that's a great question. I think there, there are a few programs which, um, which uh, um, and it depends a little bit on the faculty member in terms of if you're thinking about mechanical engineering, if someone would be open to a remote internship. Um, there are a few programs that we, uh, that we work with and I work with. Um, one is uh, a program called MyTax. Yep. And those actually work to set up uh, different internship opportunities for students internationally. And particularly they, they have a program related for, um, for Mexican undergraduate students if they're interested in doing an internship with a Canadian academic. Uh, there are uh, lots which are get, get posted there. I know that this year because of the pandemic, some of those were done remotely. Um, uh, uh, and if you're interested in internships going forward, I'm not sure if they'll be remote in the future, um, but that my tax is actually a really great place to take a look at as a gateway into some of those into some of those um, some of those uh, potential internship opportunities. But those really depend a little bit on the faculty and what those kind of look like. Um, Rory may have a few more things to add on to that if you might have. Um, um, not really. Um, my tax was very reluctant to go to remote internships, so I don't think it's likely to last once travel's restored. Um, also, to a certain extent, it's a better learning experience to actually be there in, you know, in the lab with the people you're working with. Um, the opposite, however, is also quite often true. We do have a lot of students who go overseas, the U of T degree seeking students who go overseas to do field work and research work. Uh, so bear that in mind as a possibility. If you're not already in a graduate program, you can still come to U of T and do your research in all, all sorts of parts of the world. Yeah, and and the example of the project I just gave at the end, uh, that's actually a Mexican student um, who is a PhD student in my group, um, but is actually doing field work and remote work, you know, with collaborators in Mexico, partially because, you know, he speaks the language and he, you know, he has connections there. So um, it's... Uh, it's definitely, yeah, there's definitely a lot of international collaboration that happens within research groups. Perfect. Thank you so much. To we have a question actually in the chat rather than the Q&A. Um, Jose is asking if they need to be enrolled in a university with some kind of agreement with MyTax to get the internship. The answer is no. Uh, MyTax is working with Canadian universities. So if you're at any university internationally, you can apply to MyTax to a, go to a Canadian university. Excellent. Thank you, Roddy. Uh, actually, I see right now in the question and answers uh, a comment or a question from Erika Sanchez from a National Polytechnic IPN, basically from Mexico. We have been a couple of times and we are very good friends of IPN. So uh, Erika, we can type you right away. Maybe Roddy and myself, we can type you the address uh, where you can connect. Uh, so that it will be probably helpful for you. Uh, you can of course connect Caldo through caldo at caldo.ca, caldo arroa caldo.ca. That's basically the address where you can type us. And at the same time, Roddy probably is going to type uh, where you can connect directly with the University of uh, Toronto as well. I'm actually going to ask you to email me directly, Erica, because there are different offices that handle different aspects of international partnerships. So depending on what your question is, I'll be directing you to a different place. My email address, sorry, phone going off. Uh, my email address is sgs.international at utoronto.ca, and I'll drop it into the chat. Thank you so much. I just want to remind everyone, please send your questions through the section question and answers. It is very important because that is exactly where we are reading and taking the, the questions right now. Um, okay, so let's move on with the next one. Um, Actually, there, there is another one regarding internships. I think that is a, it is very clear what uh, they were saying already. Uh, 
So I don't see more questions right now here, at least on the question and answer. Uh, let me see if there is something else here. Uh, well, actually, I think that everything else has been already answered. No, we do have one. We have one other question in the chat. Okay. Okay. Um, so it's a, the question being asked is how? What are the costs of studying at the University of Toronto? And the answer is that it varies enormously Absolutely. from program to program. Absolutely. Uh, Research-based engineering programs, uh, Master of Applied Science or PhD, students are funded for the planned duration of the program. So the costs only really become relevant if you take too long to finish your degree. In contrast, uh, there are a number of Master of Engineering programs in all engineering departments. Uh, there's eight programs across the seven departments. And for those students are largely expected to be self-funded. Um, I'm going to drop a link to the tuition fee schedule into the chat. Um, and you'll see wide, wide range uh, of tuition rates from program to program. As a general rule, research programs have much lower tuition than professional programs that yes. are designed to launch your career. Uh, but bear in mind, whatever you see for one program won't necessarily be true for another. Yes. And I just want to jump into this section just to say that all the agreements that Caldo has in Latin America with funding partners, with government agencies, are basically for research kind of masters or PhD programs. Uh, the, 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 the agreements are not in any case, including any kind of professional programs. That is something very important to highlight. So for instance, in Mexico, we do have an agreement with Conacyt. We do have an agreement with Educafin in Guanajuato. So all the programs included in those agreements are only regarding a specific research programs, nothing else. So not professional programs. That is very important to keep in mind. And it's exactly the same in the rest of the countries in Latin America, Colombia, Peru, Chile, Panama, and so on. So please, as Roddy was saying, uh, keep in mind that also thinking about research kind of programs is, um, is in most of the cases cheaper in terms of the tuition fees that professional masters as well. Of course, it's depending what kind of program are you looking for? What are your professional goals? What are you looking for to do in the following years after finishing your program? And you will need to make a decision. But regarding the scholarships in most of the cases is exactly the information that I was sharing. So here we have some additional questions. So I'll answer Diego and Laura both okay. at the same time, if that's all right. Because uh, Diego's asking how competitive it yep. is to get into research-based graduate programs. And Laura's asking, can you get in if you don't have previous research experience? It's very competitive and lack of research experience would make you less competitive than other applicants. So it partly depends on who else is applying. Uh, for research-based programs in labs, the supervisors are looking for people who are well prepared to undertake the research in the lab so that they'll be ready to finish their thesis project within the allotted time and within the allotted funding. So if you don't have research experience and you want to strengthen your, your, your profile as an applicant, you should be seeking out volunteer experience in labs at your home university uh, as an undergrad or undertaking undergraduate thesis research courses. Um, Dr. Bilton, do you have any more to add on that? Yeah, no, I think it, it'll really, I think, um, I think definitely it's, uh, so I can only comment on like my own department and, and most, most engineering, at least the emissions kind of happen very much the same. It's, um, you know, it's the individual faculty members, at least in, in mechanical and industrial that decide if you're doing a research degree, like if you would be admitted into the program. So it's really, um, you know, when I go through and I look at applications, I'm trying to understand like, is the student going to have the skills that they need to be able to kind of contribute in my group? And um, having having some research experience is definitely a valuable thing. It's not a deal breaker by any means, but um, you need to have something that sets you out from the other students that are that are interested in joining the group. Yeah. 
I, I would say some of it comes down to common sense. Anything that you think would make you a more attractive applicant probably will. So research experience is great. High marks are great. Strong reference is great. A strongly written, uh, a strongly written proposal or statement. Also, anything to set you apart in a positive way from the other applicants. Yeah, yeah, and they, often those things correlate together, right? So, like strong reference letters will often correlate with with having like a research experience that that is meaningful. Um, and you know, all those things kind of typically will kind of play together. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, uh, Amy and Rory, for all the information. And I think that uh, I will add at this point that basically um, taking the information and the candidates coming from different countries in Latin America, it is so important to do a uh, good research in advance just to clearly understand why you are interested in applying to a specific program and why you are planning to make a communication, make a contact with a specific researcher. Because it is so, as Amy was just explaining, it is so important for them to understand how you are going to contribute to the specific research group, how through your skills, your experience, your abilities, you are going to become a key element for making an important contribution to the project that they are working with. So that is something, and, you, and by the way, you need to keep in mind that you are going to be competing with people from different part of the world, not only people from your own country. So you are going to be competing with candidates coming from other countries in Latin America, uh, Europe, Asia, and so on, and even Canadians. So that's the reason why the professors, they have only a few spots available and they need to make a decision. So you really need to highlight why you are the right person to be part of that specific group. So just to be very clear, try to prepare yourself in a very convincing way that you are going to have the arguments and the explanations that you are the right person to join the group. And that is something that we see very often that is not necessarily enough support to uh, explain the reasons why you are interested in applying to a specific program. Yeah, I just want, I want to echo that a lot as well. It's like, um, you know, as a professor, when I'm, when, I'm, when I'm discussing with students or looking and interviewing students to join my group, I want to know that they're very interested in what I'm doing. They're just not interested in coming and doing a doing a degree at the University of Toronto more broadly, right? I want to know, you know, that it's they're interested in my group. They've looked into my group. They 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 know what we're doing. They're into the types of stuff that we're doing, and that's that's really the driver um, behind it, rather than you know just because they want to come to the University of Toronto. So. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And the same thing's true in a slightly different way in the humanities and social sciences. I know most today's mostly engineering, but there were a few people asking about communications. Um, so explaining why the department that you're applying to has researchers that you want to work with and what strengths you bring that complement their strengths um, to just move the work of the whole department forward and the whole field. Um, so students should check, does the university you're applying to have the resources that you need to do the research that you want to do? And are you well-trained in using those resources? And have you put together a really convincing statement of what you want to research? It has to be ambitious enough that it's contributing to the field of knowledge that you're working in, but modest enough that you're going to finish it in the time you have allotted for your degree. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. I think that we don't have more, I don't see at least right now more questions through the question and answer section. I just want to ask Dr. Amy Belton, Dr. Ju Chen, and at the same time, Rodi, uh, please share any final remarks that you think that could be interesting and useful for the people, the audience of this afternoon. Please, Amy. Yeah, I just, I want to, you know, I think, you know, um, thanks a lot for joining today. I think, uh, you know, I was really happy to share with you kind of a picture of what some of the research might look like if you're interested in some of these topics related to uh, engineering and global development. And, uh, you know, if you're interested in joining the University of Toronto, coming to these types of events and 
and you know really trying to do the background research and understand really what it's all about is like a great it's a great first step and it's a great way to kind of start things out so thanks a lot for coming um you know i've had lots of excellent students well actually i've only had one excellent student personally personally but i know i know of more excellent students from mexico within engineering um yeah more broadly um so you know um you know do the research figure out what's the best fit for you and uh and hopefully we'll see, you know, we're, you know, we're, we'll be happy to see some of you at University of Toronto, um, hopefully in person uh, yeah. very soon. We'll see. Thank you so much. Yeah. Dr. Chen. So as a researcher at uh, U of T Engineering and at CISION, like uh, what I can say is that, that, that CISION really provides us like a great platform uh, to do research. There are so many opportunities. So imagine like I'm a sociologist, but still here I'm working with engineers and we're um, promoting this kind of interdisciplinary research towards global develop development and thinking about like the new directions of engineering research and education, that kind of thing. So that's really inspiring. So um, yeah, uh, as Amy said, um, like I really look forward to uh, maybe being able to work with uh, some of you in person in the coming uh, time. Thank you so much. Yeah. Roddy? Two brief messages. Um, and one is gonna sound a little odd that it's coming from someone at U of T, um, but the overall quality of post-secondary, especially graduate education in Canada is very high. So if you're looking at supervisors here or at another Caldo University or even at another Canadian university that's not part of Caldo and you think you're a really good fit, don't let rankings of universities determine where you go. If you're going to a graduate program in Canada, you're going to be going to a good graduate program. And we can say that in Canada in ways that some other countries can't make that claim. On the other hand, as you've just heard, we have so many resources at the University of Toronto, so many different researchers working in different fields and really reaching across the boundaries between those fields that aren't necessarily available at a smaller institution. Uh, in one of my answers, I was directing a student away from graduate departments and towards research groups that have members from multiple departments. And those kinds of research groups are something that U of T is really strong is it's a really strong suit of the universities. So I'll also encourage you in looking at research programs, don't get hung up on the department. Don't get hung up on a particular uh, department program. The research you, you want to work with may actually be working in an entirely different department. So make sure that you do searches that are smart searches for your research interests, and then make sure that you're, fi you're, you're really finding a supervisor who works on what you want to work on. Thank you so much, the three of you. Really, I am very glad that you have been sharing wonderful information for candidates, for people understanding. And I just want to uh, mention a couple of things regarding what you were just saying. I think that what Roddy is saying right now, it is crucial to understand that you need to find out your best fits according to the program that you are looking for or the kind of research that you are looking for. And you need to find out where is the right potential supervisor for you. It could be certainly at one of the top universities in the world, U of T, for sure. But at the same time, probably there is someone else, you know? So that's something important to understand. And at the, and at the same time, try to find out different options because sometimes the professors, universities, departments, they get a lot of requests. They get a lot of demands. They get a lot of applications. So you need to be prepared that probably, even especially if you are thinking about a PhD, you need to find out the right fit for you. But at the same time, you need to be aware that potentially you will need to find out a second or a third option too, that could be equally interesting for you, but options that will give you some alternatives just in case you are not able to get what in your mind is your first option. So that's very important to be clear. Uh, and we see that very often in the applications from the students. And lastly, uh, but not least important, I think that what Dr. Chen was saying as well, 
it's, um, it's crucial. Here in Canada, and that is something a little bit different in comparison to uh, other countries as well, right now, there is a lot of research among different faculty members coming from different research background. And mixing up topics is becoming a new completely boundaries of innovation and new boundaries uh, of knowledge that is allowing the students, the universities to be at the top of different uh, engineering topics or health topics or many other topics that could be of your own interest. So I am just going to stop here the, my talk and I think that uh, I just want to say thank you again to every one of you. Thank you, Dr. Belton. Thank you so much, Dr. Chen. Thank you, Roddy, for all your good participation. And thank you, of course, to every one of you that took time this afternoon to be present and to get information about three very key people from University of Toronto. Thank you so much, and we will keep in touch. And please follow us through our social media, and we will continue organizing new events in the coming months. Thank you, and have a wonderful evening. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.